Mrs. Flick, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank you for this invitation. I'm happy that I can be here and that I have the opportunity to talk about powerlessness and power, and this in the context of political advice. And I should say that I'm not someone who is scientifically researching this issue because there's a huge range of uh, literature available. I am, you see, I've never been trained as a political advisor. I'm an autodidact, if you like. And therefore, I would like to give you some information or insights about this and discuss these issues with you. Therefore, I'm going to restrict myself to scientific political advice. That is the area which I'm involved in. And of course, this political advice is a much wider range. It includes natural sciences, other social sciences. So I just want to constrict myself to the scientific area. And uh, Mrs. Flick mentioned it already, Greece and the Eurozone, you know, this is really high on our agenda. It is something which moves people, which makes people think, and this beyond those who are simply interested or merely interested in economics. Being a scientist, and if you move in these circles of scientific advisors, then there's one phrase which you will always hear sooner or later, and this is what I found or what I uh, put into my presentation. My friend, all theory is gray. Now, it means uh, that scientists do not understand the world and political advice is useless. Men and women of practice have to take things into their hands. Now, this is like the thesis of the power, powerlessness of uh, political advice. So it is the powerlessness on account of incapacity, of inability. So you really have to go to the practice in order to know that. Many probably know that this is a phrase or a quote from Faust, like many quotes in our language. But some of you may have forgotten who says this phrase. It's Mephisto, the devil. You know, he's standing in a study, next to him a pupil or a student who just wants to get started learning, and he says, my friend, all theory is gray and green, the golden tree of life. So give up studying. I think you want to go for more interesting things. So again, the, the theory, the idea is that studying is something which is not necessary. So this is an idea of the devil. And devil's ideas are not necessarily wrong, but you have to consider them with a bit of suspicion. And there's one person who recognized this and who believed in the power and strength of theories was uh, John Maynard Keynes, one of the most important economists of the last century. And he mentioned a frequently quoted phrase. He said, Practical men, and he was talking about practical men of uh, economics, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Now, this means they believe in theories of a scientist, a scientist who's died quite some time ago, and they don't know because they heard about this phrase somewhere. And... Uh, heard someone mentioning these theses or phrases. So the power or the idea of the power of scientific advice, political advice, will create ideas in themselves and that the politicians haven't got uh, a choice rather than, you know, than accepting these ideas. So I see that there is no alternative. So I can say that these are contradictory ideas about the influence of political advice. And I really do not want to talk about the long-term influence of ideas. I would like to talk about uh, political advice among the living or in real time, as uh, you say nowadays. And I would uh, constrict myself to political advice in a modern democracy, so not in the past. Although there are many interesting stories around, you touched on a few and mentioned some important cases, but I would like to talk about political advice in modern democracies only. You know, 
policy advice, at least in Germany, is a very controversial issue. People often say that uh, this kind of business is or must be reformed. And I would like to discuss three questions. The first question is, how does this uh, policy advice business work? The second question is, does it make sure that policy moves in the right direction? And third, do we have to change the positioning of political advice? And you will probably remember that uh, the German Experts Council criticized a lot of things and people, uh, the euro, and people said, okay, we should get rid of it. And of course, you might say, if the person receiving the advice does not uh, really hold in high esteem the person giving the advice, then what is the use of all this? And people often think of going to a doctor or going to a lawyer and you get some advice, but you really don't like this advice and you don't like the advice either. And therefore, does it really make sense to get such an advice? I believe, yes, there is a sense or it makes sense to offer this uh, advice and accept it. Often enough, it is, uh, you know, such that I believe that this, uh, say, argument is an indication of the fact that uh, political advice in Germany really works. Or in other, in other words, I would be a bit concerned if we hadn't had any arguments about the different types of advice given. I think you have to look at this whole business of political advice, and I would like to do so offering you some models or pictures, images of policy advice, which will explain how all this works. There's one model which you might call a naive model of policy advice. It is the idea that policy advice works like this. These are the experts. They determine what the common wheel is. They tell the politicians, and the politicians put everything into practice. Now, this is a very naive model. It is based on a few assumptions. One, there is something like a common wheel. Two, the political decision ma uh, makers want to maximize common wheel. And three, the scientists want to do that too. And four, it is possible to determine in scientific terms which kinds of policies, which kinds of instruments should be used in order to put into practice this or make this common wheel come alive. Well, these are four assumptions, and economists really like to come up with assumptions. And you might say that this is a good model, but then you may say, you know, uh, do any of these uh, assumptions contradict your experience in life? So I assume there's something like a common wheel. Now, is there any an assumption which contradicts this idea? Well, of course, you could discuss for a very long time whether or not there are such contradictions. But I believe that there are many issues, that there are many requirements and demands, uh, demands which will tell you that you could really agree on such a notion as uh, the common wheel. So you want to avoid crass or drastic inequalities in the society. This is not really the problem. The second assumption is much more difficult to handle. You know, the, the political decision makers really want to increase, improve the common wheel for everyone. Now, if we have a vote in this room, those of uh, you who believe uh, that the decision makers really want this, you know, that they have a kind of approach in their policies that the common wheel is to be improved, that I believe we will not have, say, um, an agreement in this room. And the other one is that, uh, see, policymakers are not worse and not better people than others. They've got their own, their own wishes, their own ideas, their own interests, and they really pursue these interests. And surely there are many politicians who are patriots, uh, but, uh, you know, these politicians also like to stay in power, and therefore they have to think of their own reputation, have to think about other things, and they know what, ha and you know what happens. You know, what does all this mean when talking about giving policy advice or political advice? You see, the first model really doesn't work. It is doomed to failure because policymakers do not really want to maximize the common wheel. And the second assumption that the scientists want to maximize common wheel. Here the situation is similar. There are scientists, nevertheless, they understand themselves to be people who want to improve the world 
these uh, that there is some kind of self-selection. People who are interested in politics will tend to take on jobs uh, which are like uh, the po political advisors, but that then there are others who have got their own interests which they follow and pursue. Now, you can also say that sciences only want the best for the society and the policymakers do not want the best. You now uh, have seen this model in two variations. One, the variation of a personal discussion or talk. This is hardly dramatic. People often say so. And maybe other advisors have the same idea. You know, Mr. Fuss, this is really horrible that the policymakers do not accept your advice. Aren't you frustrated? Well, I consider these questions as a kind of polite question, as politeness, but they are not necessarily taken or considered to be serious questions. Because I believe everyone understands that not each and every advice of a political advisor, although it might be an excellent scientist, has to be put into practice right away because there might be reasons for handling things in a different manner. Now, the second variation is that there are scientists advisors themselves who pretend to believe in this model who to always complain that their advice is not being heard. And often enough they say that this has to do with ignorant politicians. And there's one um, economist, uh, Jeffrey Frankler, who is the economic advisor of, or was the economic advisor of the US President Bill uh, Clinton. He wrote an essay saying what can an advisor do if the president is doing bad or negative uh, policies? In his essay, he says, it really is an amazing coincidence if the president always follows the advice of his or her advisor. But the difference, and this is important, the position between the president and good uh, economics policy are very large when it comes to budget deficits, customs, agricultural subsidies, steel subsidies, and monetary policy. So here you see, this is the advise, advisor who wants to have good economics policy. And on the other side, you will find a politician who is ignorant, who is unwilling to accept these wonderful pieces of advice. I can say, for an economist, uh, it is inconsequential to assume that some people just uh, pursue their own interests, but the political advisors do not pursue their own interests. So why should an advisor uh, pursue to maximize the common wheel? Uh, why should they do that? And now there are processes who might make politicians and advisors to follow these maxims. Frank was a Harvard professor. And those who are Harvard professors have got a high level of self-confidence. You know, he was an expert. He was an advisor. He said that they always think about returning to the university. And then the colleagues are waiting for you. And those who haven't recommended good economics policy will uh, be unbearable for the university. So the colleagues will, you know, uh, unravel this person, will you know, lay open the weaknesses of this person. I don't know what you think about this idea, but at least, but at least this is what uh, Frankl wrote. So you always have, or have at the back of your mind what your colleagues think when making um, or when giving advice. You know, what scientists say is important and those who presents something which is untenable that will be criticized by his or her colleagues. I'm coming back to this issue. How can you make sure that politicians and scientists really act uh, with the common will in mind? But let me come to the fourth assumptions, which was that in scientific terms, you can find out how to improve the common will. Is that really true? Is that possible? I would like to give you an example and like to use an example which has got little to do with economics policy. I'm talking about the de death penalty. Is it, uh, you know, scaring people away from committing murders? You see, if it is not scaring people away, then an important argument for keeping it, it is no longer tenable. Of course, it can be against the death penalty, you know, then 
It is, for instance, uh, the fact that it reduces the number of murders. But I believe, you know, or you may say that this is part of, uh, say, criminology or other aspects. So it means that um, the death penalty is a deterrent, and this means uh, the murderers will always think about the costs because the costs when committing murders will increase, uh, will be increased for the murderer, and therefore they might be deterred from from uh, committing these crimes. You now the St. Gallen um, Frank Kirchgesner studied this in a meta study. This means you look at studies about this or that issue or subject and try to find out what determines the results of these studies. He looked at 102 studies and 87 of those come up with a clear-cut unambiguous result. 34 of the 87 studies say that there is a deterrent effect, deterring effect. So death penalty reduces the number of murders, and 53 studies contest this uh, deterrent effect. Now you may ask, which features of this study are the most powerful explaining, explaining factor for this result? So the question may be, have you got, did they look at American data or European data? Did they... Uh, look at what happens in the United States, uh, that is the death penalty being a deterrent, or in Europe. So because there might be different uh, outcomes, and it might also explain why some studies say, well, yes, there is a deterrent effect, and others say, no, there isn't. But this doesn't become clear. The most important explaining factor in this respect, or for the result, is that the death penalty is a deterrent, is whether or not an economist has conducted this study. And one interpretation, there are many interp interpretations of the results, but one interpretation is that something has been manipulated, but it, not, but it need not be the right explanation because, you know, it might be a fact that scientists find the things they want to find. You know, death penalty increases costs. This is something which you can discuss or whether you've got um, a, an imprisonment for life or something like this. You see, the economist would always think incentives will have an impact and this will result in a specific kind of behavior. And then, of course, this means uh, if you look at statistical data, then you want to find out which statistical data shall I use. Or you might uh, stop uh, at uh, those uh, opinions or attitudes which, you know, tally with your own ideas or assumptions. This might be the case. And, you know, others who just look at data like this will stop uh, at uh, specifications who say exactly what they think but will not look at other, say, specifications. So what I want to say, and I want to mention this example, in order to show, in order to illustrate that there are questions and issues of which you believe that the, that the scientists can answer these questions, but if you look at the results, the findings, then suddenly things become difficult. What shall we believe? You know, if you're a politician, a policymaker, and if you look at the results or if you look at the finders, then you do not really know what to do. It is not easy. What's the, the conclusion? And this is something what you hear sometimes, you know, um, you could, uh, policy advice is not a science, but something else. Well, I do not really follow this idea because you can have um, a different uh, view. Raj Chetty, an economist, wrote a wonderful article, Is Economy a Science? And he answers with yes. And he says he compares economy with medicine. In medicine, we've got a range of questions which uh, doctors cannot answer. How can you stay healthy for a long time? Is it good to drink red wine, a BMI of 26? Is it better than the one, you know, say, of 23? So these are big issues, questions. Is stress good for life expectancy? You know, these are the big issues. These are the big questions which uh, um, medical experts cannot answer. And of course, there are many, say, minor questions. And I'm sorry, and I ask for forgiveness among all those who are medical experts in this room. You see, there are many detailed questions which the medical profession can answer definitely. Which medication to take? The development of new um, cancer medication and 
you know, these are, say, very limited uh, questions that they can be answered. And this is what Chetty says. This applies to economics as well. The big questions, for instance, uh, during the times of recession, shall the government um, get um, more or accept more credits? You know, there are many deliberations, but we haven't got um, an issue, uh, an, an answer which will solve everything. We've got some insight, we've got theories, yes. But uh, to isolate all these factors when it comes to these big questions, then this is difficult for economists as well. But on the other hand, there are, say, limited or constrained questions. What is the effect if people take part in a job creation uh, or job finding measure? What happens if the wages or the salaries go down? Now, will people work less? These are questions which can be studied very well so. and. Uh, Studies have been conducted in this respect and have provided some results. But how can you handle all this when it comes to political advice? In my opinion, it's like this. We, uh, in this uh, political advice business, have to say that sometimes economics or science cannot give specific answers. We've got ideas, we've got deliber uh, deliberations, but the empirical evidence is really difficult. And I believe policy advice is something which is to you know, own up to that, should say that. Now, is um, the uh, death penalty a deterrent that it makes sense uh, not to say no or yes, but in this case, political advice must explain, must elucidate the respective evidence. What uh, and how reliable, what are and how reliable are results of studies, etc., etc. I believe this is meaningful and useful um, advice, and this is how it should work. So I can say that science cannot give unambiguous answers to many questions, but will provide information, will provide experience, will provide arguments, and they have to be assessed and evaluated. Two, we have to assume that the scientists as well as the policy makers are not wholly men, but have their own preferences, their own interests. And this means they will never be objective. Now, uh, scientific objectivity, it doesn't exist, you know, objectivity in policy advice, not to talk about it or not to assume that it, this uh, exists is something which is a bit too pessimistic. Karl Popper put it like this. It is really wrong to assume that the objectivity of the science is uh, separate from the objectivity it does not sorry, um, depends on the objectivity of uh, a scientific, scientific. It is always the outcome or the outflow of mutual criticisms. So it's all about talks. It's all about discussions among scientists and economists, you know, and having this discussion also with a critical public. People often ask me how different economists can economists can give different, uh, uh, you know, suggestions and proposals. I believe this is where you can find the answer. It would really be a bit disconcerting if every scientist gives the same answer. I believe politicians should listen to the advisors, to the economists, to the scientists, get this information and think about it, because the economists and the scientists will never give, say, an unambiguous or just one um, answer. And they, you know, the scientists can never take away the decision-making process as such from the politicians. And it should always be a decision because politicians are, say, legitimized in the democratic terms, not because they always take the right decisions. No, they are democratically legitimized. And of course, people will always make, uh, make uh, mistakes. But this is the important step. You listen to advice, but then you have to assume the responsibility and take decisions. So similar like going to a doctor. You know, if you've got a serious illness, then of course, you will hear the first opinion that is the first doctor. Then you go to another doctor and hear another opinion, but nobody can take, away, can take away the responsibility on the part of the patient uh, to say, I trust this or that doctor. And, you know, although you haven't got the medical knowledge, the medical expertise, you still have to take a decision or you have to assume uh, the responsibility in this respect. Now, what does all that mean when it comes to, you know, um, organizing or giving political advice? First, public debates. <laughs> 
are um, are important for giving advice, and this plays a crucial role. Surely, the public debate will never be perfect. And uh, Mühlbrad said, Gerd Mühlbrad, the former minister president uh, of Sax Saxony, also a scientist, he said, when it comes to elections, it's not important what the reality is, but what the electorate believes to be the reality. This is important. Therefore, if you give political advice, it is important to take into account the role of the public and understand its role. You know, you've got um, public, adv uh, sorry, uh, political advisors who meet behind closed doors, but no, this is not enough. You have to have this discourse or this argument with the public. Let let me give you an example. Recently, I demanded, and maybe you read about it in the press, if the Bundestag is to approve of a new bailout for Greece, then this is a decision which they are supposed to link with how to finance this, because this, in my opinion, is a transfer program. And as an example, I said, you might decide we increase the solidarity fee from 5.5 to 8 percent would be one solution. And, of course, you can imagine that I really caused a huge tumult among people. I received lots and lots of emails of angry, you see, listeners or viewers. But, of course, uh, this is a reality, uh, you know, that uh, something like such a bailout costs money. But many people didn't really say so. But the perception was that all this money will, you know, fall out of the sky or something like this. Or maybe some miracles will happen and suddenly the money is available. So the perceived reality was different from, say, the reality. Now, this contribution might be considered as good or even failed or even non-existing, non-existent uh, non uh, policy advice, but at least it had an impact on the discussion. And I was grateful, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Flick, you mentioned that experts are to draw the attention to problems, and I'm very grateful for this quote. So I believe this is important, draw the attention to problems. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I started with uh, Goethe, and I would like to finish with Schiller, but not with Friedrich Schiller, but with Karl Schiller. Karl Schiller is quite inter an interesting person. He was, because, you know, he's interesting because he was a scientist who went uh, into politics. This is another uh, issue, of course. Karl Schiller influenced the German economics policy in the 60s and the early 70s. Schiller was not a well-adjusted um, uh, type or guy. No, he was a brilliant mind. People you might be missing in today's politics, you might always say, they're all boring, these politicians, you know, all these minds which we had in the past, like Weiner, Strauss, and I'm sure there are many others you can come up with in Austria in particular who you might be missing. You know, people talk about and write about Schiller. They say he was brilliant, but he was also vain and supercilious, supercilious and he was resistant to accepting advice. And he knew that. And Helmut Schmidt even had to you know, feel this because Schiller said to him once, or I supposed to have said to him once, Helmut, I cannot explain it again because you didn't really understand when you attended one of my seminars. You know, Helmut Schmidt was uh, Karl Schiller's student, or one of Karl, Schmidt, uh, Karl Schiller's students. So uh, Karl Schiller was an extraordinary personality, and people often say that we need personalities like this. He said he was not a sample of an opportunistic uh, politician, and Humble once said that there is no party line when it comes to economics policy. He was always thinking along the scientific lines. He was a professor, and sometimes, you know, he really wanted to put um, in order the parliamentary group. But then Karl Schiller had to resign. And in his valedictory letter, he said that the government has the duty to look beyond the fence of uh, party politics and say in due time what has to be done and what has to be demanded or requested. And I see it. Many people today are say, um, looking for or rather yearning for such personalities. I can only say that uh, in my opinion, opinion, we should not give political advice in such a way that we become, uh, say, dependent on personalities, brilliant personalities uh, like uh, this one. Even the economics policy of Karl Schiller was certainly not above uh, any reproach, but 
You know, he followed ideas which you could not represent today, or which you could not put into practice today. What we need, we need excellent scientists in our political advice work. We need excellent uh, control of the scientists, we need an understandable, comprehensible uh, communication, and we also need a discourse, a discussion, and even a competition of ideas in the public. And this means dissent should not be considered to be a negative aspect of this discussion. I, sh I, I, I want to say it is good that uh, people attacked this expert's counsel. This is good. And even among Louis XIV, you know, the, the chairman of such an expert's uh, council Council would have been beheaded, but this is not possible today. But you know, we or in the media, we had a huge debate about politics. You know, would you not behead people, of course, but uh, maybe they would have liked to replace people, but they didn't dare to replace people. They, they didn't have the courage because otherwise, other people would really have been upset and irritated. You see, sometimes democracy really works. We need dissent. We need an exciting debate and discussion. So I say theory is not gray. A policy advice has got the power which it needs, particularly contributions coming from the political advisors leading to a discussion in the public. Then I believe policy advice really works. In Germany, we do not need more conformism, but we need, uh, say, fruit bearing dissent. So the best guardian of uh, the well being is, um, say, uh, a divided public, which, uh, of course, should have a certain level. Thank you very much.